So welcome y'all to An Otaku's Guide to Japanese History. Um, I'm Deanna, I'm a history nerd, I'm the one who made the PowerPoint. You're probably going to get very hot, tired of hearing my voice over the next hour and a half. I'm Marianne, I'm here for decoration. That's a lie. I mean, kind of. <laughs> I'm Heather Marianne. Oh, sweet. How do you spell it? M-A-R-I-A-N-E. Oh, very close. I spell it with an I. It is very, oh, I love how the I is just very French. Et oui, je française. I don't speak I was born there. Awesome. I don't remember it. <laughs> but, her, but her pronunciation is amazing. She can fool people into actually thinking she speaks French. It's a problem. Je parle français un petit peu. All right, so let's get the show on the road. So, welcome. Um, so, if you are a product of the Texas public education system like we are, you probably learn next to nothing about Japanese history in school. Like maybe a one sentence in you know the mid 1800s, and then suddenly, bam, we're fighting them in World War II, and that's all you get. Um, so, the kind of the purpose of this panel is kind of provide a background or a framework of Japanese history that will let you better understand like, references in historical anime or just like the background of you know period pieces. Um, so. So this is going to be an extremely high-speed crash course. We only have an hour and a half to get through um, roughly 14,000 years of history, um, about 1,300 of that in detail. <coughs> so we don't have a lot of time to focus on anything particularly in depth. Um, we will be fo uh, restricting our focus to areas that are generally rep over or represented in anime. So there's a lot of politic political stuff that happens we're not going to cover. We just don't have time to do that. So this is, again, an anime-centric panel. Um, because of that, we are also not going to discuss basically any women after the year 1000. Women were there. They were doing important things. However, anime is mostly concerned with dudes waving swords at each other, and so thus we have to not cover that part. So, yeah, we apologize for the omission. And um, lastly, please pardon our Japanese. Uh, we've never been to Japan. We do not speak Japanese. I am running on 15 years of subs, not dubs and one semester of college Japanese taken pass fail. <laughs> and then uh, Marianne here only speaks weeb. I do. Hot honey. Yes, I don't know. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> All right, so you know how in American history, you know, depending on you know, what era you're in, you, you may have founding fathers wrapping your feelings or, you know, potentially slaying the undead, Japanese history is also divided into a number of different eras, and we're using this as a framework to just kind of organize this uh, presentation. We are currently in the Heisei era, which is very interesting from the standpoint that if I ever give this presentation again, I'm probably going to have to update the slide, because it's due to end at the end of April when the um, current emperor retires. Um, the eras are mostly general, or, uh, generally divided into like, who's in power, which emperor's in power, which family of shogun's in power, and um, so on like that. So when the emperor retires, New era. Um, so it's gonna be weird having to update the slide. Anyway, moving on. So we get to early Japan. Chapter one. So in the beginning. In the beginning, there was Doraemon. <laughs> All right. So we're gonna start things off here with the Jomon period, which was. Um, which was roughly the, the uh, from starting from the end of the Ice Age to about 2,300 years ago. This is a period in which Japan. This is a period in which Japan was mostly inhabited by hunter-gatherers. They lived on shellfish, fish, plants they could um, gather, animals they could hunt. They tended to live in houses that were partially underground. Um, it, the Nara is named after the markings on their poetry, their, their pottery, which is kind of this corded pattern. Yep, and of course, uh, they were very well known for their raising of the Pokemon Ball Toy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then moving on, we get to the Yayoi period, in which is um, Japan's Iron Age, roughly from... Uh, 300 BC to, you know, to 250 CE. Yeah. Not too long. <laughs> During this period, Japan saw some migration from other, elsewhere in Asia, um, mostly displaced the uh, native Joman population and, and, and uh, intermarried with them a bit to form what is now the ethnic Japanese. Um, they brought with them metallurgy and agriculture, which led to more stratified society. Um, at this t uh, time period, the Japanese didn't really write about themselves yet, but other people wrote about them. The Chinese wrote about them. And which is how we know about one of the very first historical figures that we know about, which is Himiko of Yamatai, um, who was a shaman queen who was in theory buried with 100 attendants. And um, if you happen to see the 2018 Tomb Raider movie, 
She was in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Himiko of Yamatai. And moving on, we get to the Kofun period. Mm -hmm. From 250 to 548. Um, period is named after these big burial mounds that they, uh, they built. Um, at the time, there was lots of strong influence on the arts and culture by Korea and uh, Korea and China. And China. Um, they started the uh, Chinese writing was introduced to Japan. Um, also, be, you saw the beginnings of political unification in the form of the Yamato Polity or the Yamato Court, which was a uh, began as association of clans and rulers in southwest Japan and eventually grew. Um, it was it, there was the beginnings of some central administration, um, but there was no permanent capital. So at this point, it would be a good time to introduce the Imperial House of Japan. Um, so you know sometimes how in like a fantasy series or whatever, you'll have like a, you know, some king where it says, my family has ruled these lands for a thousand years. And you say, that's not really realistic. I mean, dynasties on earth don't last that long, right? Like everything from the House of Windsor is like only a little over a hundred years old, or the Habsburgs, the Plantagenets, or the various Chinese dynasties, they don't last very long. It's not realistic. It is realistic because we have one example on Earth, and that is the Imperial House of Japan, which is, at bare minimum, 1,500 years old. That is the part in which they can say, yes, there was an emperor, he definitely existed on these dates, and the rest of the Imperial House of Japan is descended from him. In the Jap official Japanese histories, he was actually the 29th emperor that the uh, imperial family of Japan actually began. Their first emperor dates back to 660 BC, 2,000, more than 2,600 years ago. Um, we're talking a guy who was contemporaries, not with the Roman Empire, not with the Roman Republic, but with the kings of Rome. We've got his uh, fellow rulers be Egyptian pharaohs, ancient Greeks, um, kings of Assyria. Like, this, this, the Imperial House of Japan is unbelievably ancient. Um, as the slide says, it's the oldest continuous hereditary monarchy in the world. Um, there is a reason, though, it's managed to survive this long, is because it is not particularly politically powerful, or it was never very politically powerful. There was the odd emperor who had you know, some control, but most of the time, they were just merely figureheads, and people who came into power, power behind them just didn't bother replacing them. Um, as a, when we describe it as a, the Portuguese, when they you know, uh, first arrived in Japan, kind of described the emperor of Japan as the Pope of Japan. Like, he's there, but he's not politically powerful. I, I say he, but there have actually been like eight or nine Japanese empresses, though not for like the last thousand years. Um, let's see, and uh, historically they're also associated with the Shinto religion. They're in theory of the highest authority in the Shinto religion. So, moving on, then we get the Asuka period. Cool. Um, this is when uh, Japan actually changed its name. It used well, to they, uh, they started writing about themselves. Like the yes, uh, they used to be called Wa, or Chinese Wo, the, from the Chinese, um, which we're not really sure exactly what that means, um, but the characters translate to something along the lines of country of dwarves, or country of short people, or even the country of submissive people. So it's not not so much of a surprise that they'd want to change that. <laughs> so instead they became Nippon or Nihon, which is the origin of the sun, of course, as we know it, um, the land of the rising sun. Yep. A little bit more poetic. Yep. Uh, and anyway, so the era begins with the introduction of Buddhism to Japan. Um, there's still a lot of Chinese influence on social, um, on culture. Um, they tried to adopt some more um, Chinese political styles didn't really work that way because instead of having like a merit-based system based on examinations, they just kind of made all the offices hereditary. Um, incidentally, if anybody knows an anime that takes place in the Asuka period, please let me know. It was the only one I could not find visual rep representation of. This particular shot is five years off and it bothers me so much. <laughs> all right, so moving on to the last of our early Japan chapter is Period. Yeah, yeah, but not that time. Yeah. Actually, I haven't quite been to this city because that city burned down and the new Nara is slightly offset. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so its capital was fixed to the city of Nara. It stopped. Uh, they used to move it around every time the emperor died due to like bad vibes and other reasons. Um, so they had a permanent capital finally, and it was a period of uh, flourishing Buddhist art and Buddhist temples. 
um, including the building of a ginormous Buddha statue that was 53 feet high and took a million pounds of copper. It, it still exists, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's in a, it's in a yeah. yeah. The, the building it's in is the largest wooden building in the world. Yeah. It was under construction again when I went there. Did it go? No, I didn't. It was under scaffolding. That was so sad. Another fun fact, even though it's the largest wooden building in the world, it used to be even bigger. Yep. Then it burned down again. Lots of stuff burns down. Wood. It yes. burns. Wood. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? Wow. Yeah. Right. Maybe they should build something out of wood. All right. Anyway, so now we get to our first like real era in which we're going to go in depth. This is the first period in which you actually see a lot of anime taking place in, which is the Heian era. Cool, so the Heian era, which lasted from 794 to 1185. So the period was named after the capital city of Heian Kyo, which is Kyoto, the capital of peace and tranquility. Um, it's generally known as being like the classical era of Japanese literature. Um, there, it was the first period, or first period in which there was a development of Japanese culture that was distinct from the Chinese and Korean influence. So it's the first, like, really Japan, Japan period. Um, as, as I said, responsible for many classical works of literature, art, and poetry. Um, during this period, the emperor was in theory in power, but really um, was controlled by the Fujiwara clan, who ruled from behind the scenes. Um, basically, they married into the royal family at every opportunity. Like, there would be long stretches in which every single emperor's mother was a Fujiwara. Um, the, their, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Fujiwaras named themselves the Imperial Regent. When any of the emperors did something they didn't like, they would just kind of have them deposed and would just point a new one. Um, it is important to note in this era, or in my discussion here, that, um, so you've heard the phrase, like, history is written by the victors, right? History is also written by anyone who wrote anything at all. <laughs> and during this period, most of Japan was illiterate. The peasants, of course, didn't write anything down. People who did write stuff down were the very wealthy and powerful people, often who lived in Kyoto. And we are talking here about not the one percenters, the one-tenth of one percenters. So just keep in mind, this is, does not reflect Japanese culture as a whole during this period. This is just the part, cool parts that people wrote stuff down and what the rich people were up to. So first off, um, hay and fashion for men. As you can see, it's a bit more boxy looking than a lot of um, later, uh, later clothing styles. Hats were very big. Everybody wore hats. Those pointy hats there are... Um, uh, the pointy hats are iboshi. If you were of lower rank, they might be floppy. If they're pointy, you're important. Um, and the hat with the little quail tail in the back, those are kanmuri. They're much more um, religious, or much more formal. You use them for like going to court or for li religious ceremonies. And then for women, it is all about layering. All about the layering. Um, they would wear these um, layered silk robes, very thin, all different colors, and you'd have them arranged precisely so so you could see all the colors at their collar and at your sleeves. Um, the colors were very important. Um, you could talk about, you know, they were changed with the seasons or who you're politically close with or your friends. You could say a lot with your colors. Um, so they spent a lot of time making sure they were exactly right. Um, you wear your hair long, as long as humanly possible. If it drags on the floor, congratulations, you are super fashionable. Um, Makeup-wise, they would shave off their eyebrows, draw them really high up in their forehead. They're not represented here, unfortunately, but you draw them really high up in your forehead and you would paint your face white, or as pale as you could get it. Now, the problem with painting your face white is it makes your teeth look really, really, really yellow. So what do you do about this? Bleach them? No, you paint them black. Tooth blackening was um, high fashion for Japanese women all the way up through the 1860s. Um, and uh, want to take a guess on what they uh, were made of? I had to look this up last time. Anybody know what, how they made the tooth black? What, what they used? Squidding? Nope. Tar? Nope. nope. A combination of vinegar and iron filings. Oh, Jesus. Them. <laughs> really good for the enamel. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so now we get to Japanese, or Haikaian literature. So one of the interesting things about this, the literature of this period is that a lot of the stuff that got preserved or passed down was written by women and not men, as is typical in a lot of medieval writings. Um, court women were kept isolated, so they wrote to entertain each other, so kind of like they're sitting around writing fan fiction. Um, 
they were not permitted to learn Chinese or the law or philosophy, so fiction was what they wrote. Um, they also, because they weren't allowed to learn Chinese characters, they wrote in the vernacular, which also made their writings more accessible and therefore more likely to be preserved. So it worked out pretty well. Um, so the two authors we're going to talk about today, so the, fir of the first one, the first one is Sei Shonagon. She is best known for what is known as the Pillow Book, which is kind of like a, a diary and bits of poetry, assorted musings, um, and uh, for our purposes, it had was full of listicles. She would write lists of things, like embarrassing things, or unusual things, or things I despise. The original BuzzFeed. Yes, the original BuzzFeed. Um, so we have for you a one of Sei Sh Shonagon's listicles for you. All right, things that people despise. <laughs> The north side of a house. Someone with an excessive reputation for goodness. An old man who has lived to be too old. A frivolous woman. And a mud wall that has started to crumble. Yes. There you go. Five things that people despise. Um, one of the, there was a list that I liked that was too long, unfortunately, for this, but it was a list of embarrassing things, and there was one that was very relatable. It was, um, it was embarrassing things. When you go to someone's house and then the wrong person comes to the door, and this is extra embarrassing if you've, got a, if you've brought a gift. <laughs> All right. Um, and then the other one we'll talk about is the, um, the Tale of Genji by Murasaki Shikibu. Um, it is either the oldest or one of the oldest novels ever written in the world. Um, if you had gone to high school in Japan, there's a good likelihood or pretty much you would have read some of this uh, work. Um, it tells, tells the tale of Hikaru Genji, the son of the emperor, who is really pretty and really good at everything. And he sleeps around a lot. And considering old time in Japan was pretty much polygamous, you have to imagine how much he slept around to, in order to be considered a playboy. Um, the reference probably best need to know about is at some point he adopts a daughter named Murasaki. She's 10 years old. Um, he adopts her because she reminds him of his lover. His lover happens to be his stepmother whom his father married because she resembles Genji's mother. So unpack that as you will. Um, and when Murasaki's older, he decides that she's the love of his life, he marries her, then she's done, then she dies, and he's sad, and he goes in exile for a while, and then he dies, and it follows his son for a while. Like this, this uh, the story is about like a million words long, 400 characters, and just kind of ends. Um, so you may have noticed that this story featured a girl named Murasaki, and the author's name is Murasaki. Is this so, the first example of a Mary Sue? <laughs> Actually, it's the exact opposite, yeah. or as close as you possibly can get. Thanks to the patriarchy, <laughs> uh, women's names often weren't written down. Um, so uh, the author has actually been nicknamed after her character, Murasaki, because we don't know what her actual name is. Um, and, and, and as it turns out, say, uh, say Sonagon is also a nickname because they, we don't know her name either. Yep, so imagine that. So you write something and a thousand years later, nobody knows what your name is. Murasaki with three children is Fujiwara Taeko? Yeah, we're not 100% certain, no. Mm -hmm. But it's, cool. um, yeah. So, all right. Fujiwara, we're a winner this day before. Yeah. <laughs> I think she's a Fujiwara, so it's really Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, so now one more bit of fun Heian historical classical stuff. We are having our Heian era poetry jam. Woo! So, can I get three volunteers from the audience? I've got some poems to read. They're very short. They're all in English. So one, two, the third person. There you go. Right. Winner gets candy, by the way. And that helps in a <laughs> Yes, there's a, there's a winner. Um, <laughs> so do you like coming up? Poetry you can come to the front. Yeah, po poetry contests were a big thing, so we're, uh, that's why we're having a poetry here. contest. Yeah. This is easier, I think. All right, so I'll give an example of one. Oh, and then then oh yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Just, uh, uh, I mean, they're all like four. Yeah, they're, they're very short. <laughs> OK, fine. All right. Pick one. Pick one, anyone. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Alright, cool. Let's see what we got left. I'll, I'll, I'll read one to start, just for funsies. Okay. Um, yes. Let's see. Like a driven wave, dashed by fierce winds on a rock, so it is, alas, crushed, and all alone am I, thinking over what has been. So it's very, uh, they're all very uh, sappy. 
Yeah, um, but at the time, the aesthetic was like the intransience of beauty and life. So everything's very sad. All right, so how we'll do this is we'll have each person go, and then we'll go. Vote we'll, we'll, we'll my audience. Yeah, we'll my audience, audience vote. Um, yes. so winner, gets, winner gets pocky, everybody gets a gummy. Should we have everyone read first and then do audience? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to go first? I'm here. All right. Like the morning moon, cold, unpitying was my love. Since that parting hour, nothing I dislike so much as the breaking light of day. <laughs> so hard though. Right. Come this way. Never mind. Front seat. <laughs> it is for thy sake that I speed seek the fields in spring, gathering green herbs, while my garments hanging sleeves are with falling snow reflect. Very dramatic. Are these black or white long ears? Okay. These these all read like rejected me a you know, Waka Waka! Yep. <laughs> Like the water spires that the imperial gateway kept, burning through the night, through the day in ashes dulled, is the love aglow in me. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> all right. So, all right. For reader number one, we will do a cheer. Oh. What about round of applause? All right. Okay. Reader number one. Reader number one. <laughs> All right. Read number two. Read number three. These were all very, very much the same. Um, all right. Be more opinionated, guys. <laughs> take, take, take a. You got to commit. All right. All right. Read number one. Hands up. All right. All right. All right. Okay. Cool. Cool. Read number two. Damn it, guys. Read number three. I think it's reader number two. It's reader number three. All right, all right, reader number two. All okay, right. so come on, guys. We have we have gummies and pocky. Gummies for, gummies for everyone, pocky for the winner. Everybody gets a gummy. Well, I appreciate that because I totally stuttered through the first line. So but you push through. No, because no one has to push through it. Gummy. Yeah. 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 Oh, damn it. Why is it making me toss it? I'm in here. I'm in here. I'm Me too. Same, same, same. Oh, it's a soccer goalie. <laughs> so what we're reading from is o the Ogura Shyakunin issue, which is a collection of 100 waka poems by 100 different authors, compiled by Fujiwara no Teka, and it's the basis for the Utagarata or Karata card deck. Oh. Uh, if you've seen Chihaya Furu, Yay. this is what we were reading from. And uh, credit where credit is due, this is the 1917 Macaulay translation, which I picked because it's more poetic and less literal. Uh, mm -hmm. It's good for reading. All right, so moving on. So we get to our first anime recommendation, which is Utakoi. Um, it's, it's a couple years old, you can find it on Crunchyroll. Um, it's a series of very short romances taking place in the Han area based on these 100 poems. Each, you know, each romance is about one poem. They're very short, only one episode to half an episode, so if you're a tired of anime, they never get together. Here are very short, actually satisfying romances. It's very beautiful. It also doesn't take itself entirely seriously, so, you know, don't expect, like, everything to be a oh, terrible tragedy. It's a fun series. Really yes, it is. Really, really, really pretty. pretty. <laughs> um, anyway, so moving on, so now we get to what is going on beyond Kyoto's court. And this is the part where I get to talk about tax policy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 tax policy. He's like, what yeah. tax policy? How can that be important? It's very important. So there was a saying about Japanese peasants. First of all, peasants are the ones who get taxed. Um, there's Johnny a saying about peasants. There's a saying about peasants. Um, I know it was used later, I'm not sure if it was used at this time period, but it was, peasants are like oil seeds. The more you squeeze, the more you get. <laughs> um, this is saying the peasants were taxed very, very heavily. The nobility and the Buddhist temples were not. They had carved out tax exemptions for themselves. As accordingly, they become very rich because they're essentially not paying income taxes, and the peasants are left very, very poor. Now, if you're a peasant, you know, like, I don't like this at all. So what you're going to do is you're going to basically give your lands over to the nobility or the temples, and you'll agree to work it and kind of be like a serf, but you know, you're not going to be taxed because now you're attached to a tax-free estate. So the, this is the effect of the uh, local lords becoming extremely wealthy, and meanwhile revenues for the government fall off. And accordingly, they can't provide services, but this is the medieval times, so the services they provide are basic law and order. 
So you get an increase in piracy and bandits. Of course, local lords don't like pirates and bandits either, so they hire private armies and, pri and warriors to defend their lands, aka samurai. So they become extremely wealthy and militarily powerful at the expense of the central government. And you can see this is going to be a problem with the power imbalance that's going on, all because of tax policy. <laughs> um, also at this time, the Fujiwara clan declined in influence, so you have some problems in the of bureaucracy and just the functioning of government. Uh, they seized them into currency, uh, break down the law and order. Um, so you get to the end of the era of peace. It concludes with the Genpei War, which was a conflict between the Taira and Minamoto clans over control of the imperial court. Basically, who's going to be allowed to appoint the next emperor? Um, after Taira win a couple times, the Minamoto finally defeat them, emerge victorious, and Minamoto no Yoritomo becomes the shogun, and we enter into our next chapter, the Age of the Samurai. Yay! Ooh. That is sort of stranger, incidentally. If you ever want to see an, a, a movie with jaw-dropping sword fights, it's this one. Guys waving swords at each other. Yay! Yay. That's not my name. So first, Sword of the Stranger, yes. Um, Funimation actually rescued the license. I was super happy because they put it up in Blu-ray and it needed a Blu-ray. Um, so anyway, so welcome. So first of all, what the hell is a Shogun? <laughs> so first of all, it's the short form of Sei Tai Shogun, the barbarian subduing Generalissimo. Um, they were the military dictators of Japan. They were nominally imported by the emperor. Um, however, sometimes they actually weren't in charge at all. Um, it was the... Uh, Formal government was known as a bakufu, a tent government, and you can just think of overlapping layers of influence. Just like there's a government, but really the power behind the throne is this guy, but the power behind his throne is this guy. Um, you could potentially have a situation in which rule in Japan is the emperor, an ex-emperor, an imperial regent, a dictator, a shogun, the regent to the shogun, and a retired regent to the shogun. Only one of these men is in charge. Which one? They know but no one else does. <laughs> uh, so moving on. Now, so with the you know, Minamoto no Yoritomo becoming Shogun, we enter the Kamakura period. Kamakura! Yay! <laughs> yeah, awesome! So the capital was moved to Kamakura, and you had a feudalistic society, land-based economies, local military rule with lords and vassals. Um, the Minamoto lost power extremely quickly and were basically controlled by the Hojo clan or other, other various um, lords. Um, at this point, they come, here comes the Mongol invasions, and there is, it should be noted, in fact, I don't think a lot of people remember that the Mongols held the largest land empire that has ever existed. They ruled from Eastern Europe to China, to India, Vietnam, an incredible swath of territory. And it, during the Kamakura period, they decided to invade Japan. Now, as you might know from the standpoint, it's only a single bullet point on one slide. They obviously did not succeed. <laughs> um, their first invasion was uh, driven back by a typhoon. And some years later, they sent a larger invasion. We're talking 4,000 ships with 150,000 soldiers, also thwarted by a typhoon. <laughs> the so-called Kamikaze, or Divine Wind, that saved Japan. Um, though there, even though they didn't succeed, this did cause some problems back home, that the cost of defending against the Mongols made the uh, local wars very mad because it cost a lot of money and they didn't get anything out of it because there were no new lands to distribute, um, which decreased the Kamakura Bakufu's influence. Um, also during this time, we get the Kanmu Restoration, which the Emperor briefly gains power, and then loses it again to the next shoguns. And so first of all, samurai. We should talk about samurai. So it's important to note that early samurai were very different than later samurai. These early samurai were kind of like landed knights who served their lords in battle. Um, they were not a distinct social class. Being a samurai was more of what you did and less of who you are. Um, like if you had said to quit being a, to quit, you know, using a sword and go off and make umbrellas instead. If you had lived in this area, you're probably not a samurai. If you lived in the Edo period, you probably were still a samurai. You were just weird. Um, it also should be noted that um, samurai have been heavily romanticized about using swords. They did use swords. They did carry swords. However, they didn't actually use them as much as you think they would. Swords aren't actually that useful in a large battle. You can't kill anybody unless you're about this far away. 
Swords are also expensive. They take a lot of metal. They take a lot of work to put together. Um, you also maybe require a lot of training. Have you ever seen any, you know, buddy playing lightsabers with each other? You know, unless you know what you're doing, it's hard to use a sword. Um, for peasant armies, generally they would actually just use pole arms. Like most samurai would actually, a lot of samurai actually just use bows and arrows. Um, peasant armies generally used pikes, spears, various kinds of pole arms because two reasons. First of all, they're much, much, much cheaper because most of it's made of wood. If you're an extremely cheap lord, you just have them sharpen the end. With a little bit more money, you put a pointy bit on the end. Um, they're also much easier to train and to train because, you know, presumably these peasants know how to use farming implements and you just say poke them. Poke the enemy. Mm -hmm. Much easier to understand. And, you know, if you're, and also, if like, you know, you've recruited, say, a poor 16-year-old peasant boy who's never left his village, you also want to I want him to keep as far away from his enemies as possible because he's less likely to start screaming and running away. So yeah, pole arms, samurai, less swords. All right, where am I? I lost the spot on the page. Oh, all right, here we go. So now we get into the Muromachi period, also called the Ashikaga period. Um, these local lords are known as, now known as daimyos, and political power continues to fracture. The daimyos become more and more and more powerful. Um, also during this period, we get the first contact with the Portuguese in 1542. Um, the period and or the period <coughs> also during this period is happens what is known as the Onan War, which is another battle of succession. The thing we need to know about the Onan War, though, is it is the point in which we, everyone realized Japan is a free for all. This war raged for about 10 years, and no one could stop it. At this point, the lords realized, all the daimyo realized, that you can take what you want. You can have what you want. The only thing to stop you is the size of your own army, the size of your neighbor's army, and the extent of your own ambitions. Which leads us to our next chapter. The Sengoku Jidai. Sengoku Jidai, chapter four. So this is, or, so this is Japan's Game of Thrones period, essentially. <laughs> Uh, conquest, alliances, betrayal, strategic marriages. If it could happen, it did happen, and it lasted for like 130 some years. So that's a lot of seasons. Um, the power struggle between uh, the daimyo for control of Japan, and it finally concludes with the establishment of the Tokugawa shogunate. So, it, it, anime really loves the Sengoku period. Like, they said a lot of stuff in it. Everything from Inuyasha to this season's Dororo, which is amazing, by the way, so please watch it if you're not watching it right now. Um, there are some set in the Sengoku period. You start getting really weird anime set in the period, like um, Sengoku Nightblood, in which everyone is a werewolf or vampire. <laughs> no. um, and then you get No Banana the Fool, in which they hang out with Joan of Arc on another planet, and there's Mecha. Why not? And then there's this one here, uh, Ikumu Sengoku, which I'm only including because Crunchyroll gave it an amazing subtitle. <laughs> I know, I know, it's, it's CGI and terrible and wonderful at the same time. Because why not? Because why not? And everyone is so pretty. All right, so... Everyone is pretty in real life. No, they're yeah. definitely not. Um, <laughs> oh, and uh, kind of emphasize they are definitely we're not. There is literally an entire subgenre of turning middle-aged, bloodthirsty warlords hey! into cute and hot girls. <laughs> uh, there are way more than this. This is like 10 seconds of Googling. Like, seriously, Japan, like, why? why so that, that we trash like me can watch half of them? Yeah, yeah, but, but, but still, like, think how terrified would be if we turned the Falcon Fathers into hot girls. This is weird, come on. Um, working on it. Yeah. Working on it. Yeah. I want to see a sexy Abraham Lincoln lady. <laughs> Same story. It exists. exists. Oh God. Um, Thank you, Hansa. <laughs> now I know it never go again. Uh, so anyway, so Sengoku period is too long and too convoluted as to actually go into the twists and turns of what's going on. That would literally take an entire another panel or more. So we're just going to discuss like seven of the most prominent figures from the period that you're likely to see represented in anime. And, and uh, Marianne here is going to provide fun facts about Sengoku Warlords. Yay! So first up, we get Takeda Shingen. I put a little map there to show where they were. Um, the ti he's known as the Tiger of Kai. Um, he was best known for cavalry tactics. He was also a very able civil administrator. A lot of his ideas were copied by later people. 
all so fun facts. Oh, so first of all, how many of you are over the age of 20? Pretty much everybody here. So you want to feel really inadequate? <laughs> <laughs> when talking to Shingen was about 20, he had deposed and exiled his father when his father attempted to name one of his brothers as his clan heir. So, uh, so how's your relationship with your dad at age 20? <laughs> I can't <laughs> kill him, so I think that's a plus. Oh, he just, you know, he just exiled him. Oh, he didn't kill him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Actually, fine. Oh, he did. Oh, okay. Whatever. <laughs> we still deposed him, so, you know. Uh, right. Yeah. And also, while he may have been a Buddhist priest and a vegetarian, uh, that didn't stop him from sometimes sensing criminals to be boiled alive. Scary, yeah. scary vegetarian. Yes. <laughs> he made people soup and didn't but eat it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Pokemon so next. Conquest. That's so awesome. I know. So <laughs> next up, we get Uesugi Kenshin, better known as the God of War. He was also really good at ruling. He's also a really good general. Yep. Now, fun facts. He had an epic uh, respect, hate, like shonen anime rivalry uh, with Takeda Shingen. They fought a lot. They actually may have even fought each other in person, which, uh, contrary to what fiction tells you, almost never happened. It's kind of like playing chess and putting and having your kings check each other, which is really dumb. I mean, I ship it. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fourth Battle of Kawanakajima. Yeah. Awesome story. Yeah. yeah, I mean, according to legend, um, at one point Kenshin burst into Shingen's camp on horseback and attacked him with a sword, but Shingen countered his strike with a sweep of his iron warpath. It's very dramatic. Yes. <laughs> and so next up we get Sanada Yukimura. He was not as high ranked as the first two. He kind of bounced around to different lords during his time period. Um, he is generally depicted as using a spear. Yep, more realistic. <laughs> All right. Uh, his actual name was Sanada uh, Nobushige. He actually never went by Yukimura at any point in his life. Um, Yukimura was made up by an author in the Edo era, and that's where he was remembered as. Um, he, and he actually died at the epilogue of the Sengoku period, the sage of Osaka Castle. He sat down in camp, took his helmet off, and was so exhausted that he fell to attacking enemy forces with little resistance. So it's kind of like dying in the last page of the book. You're like, really? Uh, really? Oh, this guy. Yeah, but he's going to be 48, though. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. So speaking of making it a 48, so we get to a guy who actually made it to his 60s, what? which is Date yes. Masamune. Yes. He can ride his horse with no handlebars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so he's infamous for only having one eye. He was known as the one-eyed dragon, and he was a very shrewd tactician. Uh, but he actually, he didn't lose his eye doing anything cool. He had, had smallpox as a kid, and that's how he lost his eye. So he's kind of embarrassed by that, and most of the art um, that he had actually done himself right, during his, yeah, during yeah, his, during his yeah. lifetime, he's like, hey, give me two eyes, please. Yeah, like, yeah. Spy, like that's yeah. <laughs> so he would have to leave, like every anime adaptation has him in a cool eye patch, and he would have just hated that. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, and he's actually really unusually permissive of Christians and Christian missionaries in an era in which they were officially persecuted by the Japanese government. Um, in his later years, he even had a ship built and funded an expedition that enabled a group of Japanese Christians to visit the Pope in Rome. Yeah, another round of fun facts. Some of those Japanese Christians got off the boat in Spain. So if you are writing a historical novel and really meet ninjas in Spain in the 1600s, you have justification. <laughs> <laughs> Their descendants live in Correa del Rio. <laughs> All right. It's time for Who's That Warlord? <laughs> it's Takeda Shingen with boobs. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, so now we're going to get to the final three, the three unifiers, a.k.a. the guys who won. The ones you've probably heard of more. Yeah. <laughs> Pokemon so, Conquest, yay! I know! Uh, so, first up, though, I would like to dump a bucket of cold reality on this a little bit here. Uh, I would like to emphasize that these were real humans. Um, real humans who embarked on campaigns of conquest. Um, not, and uh, by the standards of 2019, we're not good people. Um, let's see here, Oda Nobunaga had his brother killed to become head of the clan. Um, Toyotomi Hideyoshi had no children, so he designated his nephew as his heir, and then when he did have a son, he forced his nephew to commit suicide and killed his nephew's entire family. Um, Tokugawa Iyasu, er, Iyasu here um, had his wife and eldest son in or executed in order to appease Nobunaga. Um, their, I guess, pursuit of their ambitions um, led to deaths of thousands of people, thousands of soldiers, thousands of civilians, tremendous amount of human suffering. Um, 
you know, there's a good argument to be made that this was necessary in order to consolidate the control of Japan and turn it into the country it is today, but just kind of keep in mind that this was, um, these are real people and their, their achievements were built upon the backs of a tremendous amount of human suffering. So anyway, so moving on to more fun things. But yeah, anyway, just want to mention, so this is Nintendo going, this is official art, and they're like, you know who would make great role models for children? <laughs> <laughs> These guys. All right, so first up we get Oda Nobunaga. Um, he was the second son of a minor lord. He defeated his brother to become head of his clan. Um, he conquered much of the main Japanese island of Honshu. He was the first guy who would really seize control, um, thus setting the country on the path for political reunification. Um, crowning achievement, he seized the city of Kyoto in 1568. He set up the very last of the Ashikaga shoguns as a puppet, and then when the puppet displeased him, he had him deposed. Um, so how did he do it? Oh, first, oh, first of all, here's the extent of his conquest. He goes from that little red dot there to a huge chunk of territory. And uh, to kind of give you an idea of how much territory this was, I have overlaid this over a map of the United States. So he seized, you know, a good chunk of North Texas, some Oklahoma, some Arkansas. It was pretty impressive if you do this. There's lots of mountains in the way and you're on horseback or on foot. So pretty cool. Um, so how did he do this? So a couple, couple ways he could do, um, a couple reasons he was successful. Um, first of all, he was, first of all, just a general, a very good general. Um, he, there was particularly one of his early battles in which he managed to defeat an invasion force of about 25,000 men with only two to 3,000 of his own. So he was dang good at fighting. Um, he also had benefited some, some really good luck. Um, none of his, his enemies did not unite against him. If uh, Takata Shingen and Iwesuke Kenshin, it was generally said if Takata Shingen and Iwesuke Kenshin had united against him, he would have been toast. But they did not. They also conveniently died. Um, Takata, Takata Shingen got, uh, died first, and it, his uh, domain was left in the hands of his much less competent son. Um, and then uh, Iwesuke Kenshin, right before he and Nobunaga were scheduled to go up against each other, died very suddenly. And so the point where his uh, generals thought assassination? No, just very poorly timed case of stomach cancer. Um, let's see here, where was I? Um, also, he, oh, Nobunaga was um, implemented some economic reforms, um, made, uh, allowed trade to flourish, and of course, when the economy is good, it feeds the engines of war. Um, he was a early supporter of firearms. He, that's what he was known for adopting. Again, firearms that only arrived with the Portuguese in 1542. Within six months, the Japanese were making guns. Like, they, they had some guns before that were Chinese-derived, but they were not nearly as good as the European weapons, which they were now making. Um, uh, Odenaba had, uh, Oden, Odenobunaga had uh, gunpowder, a gunpowder really supported. He uh, had many, he tried to have as many guns manufacturers as he could. Um, infantry drills and tactics, um, advances in that. Have you ever seen in movies um, a situation where you've got two ranks of riflemen? Again, these are only one shot guns. Two ranks of riflemen. First rank will shoot, then they'll drop down and reload. Meanwhile, second rank shoots, and then they drop down and reload. Meanwhile, the first rank back up can shoot again. Um, this style of switching like this, it doubles your rate of fire and is very effective. Nobunaga figured out how to do this 20 years before the Europeans did. So there was probably a very tiny window in which, soldier for soldier, they were probably superior to European forces. Um, not in numbers, but just in tactics. Um, where was I? Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, he was also known for uh, brutally suppressing his opponents. Um, lots of civilian deaths. Um, notable instance in which he was going to get up against a temple full of monks on top of a mountain. He could not, he could not defeat them. So he had his men set fire to the mountain. Fire burns up, monks burn down. Also burning down, all the villages on the mountain. Thousands of people dead. So, anyway, so what happens to Odin Nobunaga? So he decides to stop for a tea ceremony at a temple, Honoji, um, on his way to something or other, and then he is suddenly betrayed by one of his own generals, Akechi Mitsuhide. They are in the white hair looking very villainous. <laughs> But, of course, he had to die in the most epic way possible, which is committing seppuku, uh, you know, ritual Dis disembowelment, the gutting of oneself, as the temple burned down around him. Like, you can't get a death more metal than that. It's, yeah. it's pretty metal. Yeah. Uh, and as for Akechi uh he declared himself the new ruler of Nobunaga's territories, but he lasted, like, 
two days before Nobunaga was avenged by the next unifier on our list, and that is Toyotome Hideyoshi. A good, good monkey boy. Yeah. So if if the Sengoku period was Game of Thrones, this guy would be, I would say, 25%, well, 15% Jon Snow, 85% Littlefinger. Um, he was... <laughs> He, he was notable in that he came from literally nothing. He was born a peasant. He was the son of a foot soldier. He joined Oda, Oda Nobunaga's army as his sandal bearer, bearer, literally the guy who carries his shoes. When he died, he was imperial regent. He ruled all of Japan unquestionably. unquestionably. Um, let's see, he was a shrewd tactician. He was also fantastic at diplomacy. He could make allies like that. And he um, also implemented major societal reforms when he was a ruler that just reduced the warfare and actually got Japan underneath control. Uh, you also may notice, as I called him our good, good monkey boy, there's a common theme with that. Uh, and the reason for that is that Oda Nobunaga himself nicknamed him Monkey. And character designers are like, okay, we can do that. Yeah, it's good. So Make him distinctive. Yep, so you rule Japan and you're forever after remembered as a monkey. Good job. Thanks, Nobunaga. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so what did he do in terms of societal total reforms? How did he stop fighting? So, a couple things. So first of all, you know, figured out that like, an armed population can't fight very well. So I should con confiscate, confiscate all the weapons. So there was this mass sword hunt in which peasants were like told, basically, give up, give up your, uh, give up your weapons. Um, second of all, he implemented, he, uh, had a census taken of all his territories and, and uh, began taxing them more accurately. And taxes had to be paid on the basis of rice. Like, you actually had to pay your taxes on rice. Now, this had also the daimyo were not allowed to have like tax for the states anymore. They had to pay their taxes. Anyway, so the paying of rice has a, a twofold effect. First of all, it takes peasants to grow rice. So you have to keep your peasants home to, to literally grow your taxes. Second of all, an army marches on its stomach. If the taxes are being paid to the central government, you don't have as much food to feed an army, and it's harder to fight a war. So that must have reduced the conflict that way. Um, he solidified class structures to prevent people from basically being ambitious. Didn't want anybody else to do what he did, essentially. Um, there were restrictions on movement, like you couldn't leave the territory, like certain territories. Um, you had to follow the professions of your father, for instance. Um, in terms of samurai, though, he really reform the samurai, um, basically defang them. So before, samurai were kind of like the land of the knights. They were pledged to a lord, they had lands, they, they did well, their lords re rewarded them with more lands. Hideyoshi had a thing in which, or implemented policy in which samurai were given a choice. The first choice is you leave your lands, generally come to the cities. In rewards, to, in, the, in the exchange for this, you're allowed to remain being a samurai in name and class, you can keep your swords, you'll get paid a rice stipend by the government. You can still work for a ward, but you're just an employee, basically. Or the alternative is you can keep your lands, give up your swords, and you are now a peasant. No one wants to be a peasant. So most of the samurai took him up on his offer and left their lands and, became, and remained samurai, but no longer the landed warriors of old, which made them much, much easier to control. So, what happened to Toyotomi Hideyoshi? Alright. He, however, had two major weaknesses. The first was that he had <laughs> way too much ambition, and the second was that he had an incapacitating lack of children, and thus, heirs. Yeah. So, he decided he was going to go conquer the world. He conquered Japan, he's going to go conquer the world next. Conquering the world means conquering China. But first, Korea. So he implement, he uh, has several military campaigns in Korea. There's some initial success. They capture the city of Seoul, for instance, and then it all goes to hell. Um, supply lines are long. The Japanese Navy is crap. It's just an epic failure. Now the problem is that the soldiers that he sent off to Korea were those of his most loyal daimyo. You know, the guys who liked him the best. Meanwhile, they lose, they lose influence, they lose power, and the guys who are left are the guys who don't like him. Which you can see is a problem. He also suddenly starts dying. I don't know exactly what he died of, but it took him a while to die. He knew he was going. And he only has one son who is five years old. You can't possibly hold together a country. So what does he do? He appoints um, 
let's see there. Yeah, he appoints five regents, the five most powerful daimyos, to basically rule in his son's stead. And when his son is of age, his son will take power, essentially. And you can imagine those daimyo. They're like, oh yes, of course, we'll do whatever you say. We will let your son rule us when he is of age. We will promise not to take Japan for ourselves. <laughs> you can imagine exactly how long this lasted once Toyotomi Hideyoshi's corpse started cooling. Basically that long. So they immediately start scheming against each other and eventually one of them emerges victorious. And that is Tokugawa Ias in his anime abs of steel. <laughs> at least in one of them. At least in one of them. I think the guy on the, the far side of the beard, he might have anime abs of steel too, but not the guy in the middle. Um, he's got anime cheeks of adorable Yeah, he's got anime cheeks. So this is the, uh, the guy who won. The first of the Tokugawa shoguns. Um, to cite the Game of Thrones example, he is probably, oh, call it 2% Theon Greyjoy and 98% uh, Tywin Lannister. This is a cool cucumber and utterly ruthless. Um, he had an extremely terrifying childhood. He was a political hostage, as his, his father would send him around to secure his alliances, essentially as insurance. Like, like, I break my alliance, you kill my son. Yeah! So you can imagine how that kind of affected him. Um, at one point, he was actually, while he was being transferred between his, his father's allies, he was captured by Oda Nobunaga's dad, who threatened to kill him. And the old Lord Tokugawa was like, sure, do it out. You keep him alive, I've got a son. If you kill him, that will show my allies I need to hold to our agreements. So despite this, that uh, Tokugawa Ias grows up, he actually follows around the guy who threatened to kill him. Um, he becomes a ally of Oda Nobunaga and becomes quite powerful. At the time, Tori Tobi Hideyoshi takes power. He is the number two guy. They make some arrangements that uh, Iyasu will support him. He also doesn't have to go off to Korea, which is nice, so he becomes more powerful. And so he is very much the number two guy, and when Tori Tobi Hideyoshi dies, he is very much the number one guy. So during this conflict between the daimyo after the death of Hideyoshi, we finally <coughs> conclude with, finally concludes the grand finale of the Sengoku period, which is the Battle of Sekigahara in 1600. This battle was colossal. We're talking 160,000 men. Now, I throw out numbers sometimes. They don't really mean anything. Like when you get to some point, like how many men is 160,000? I don't know. So I guess we're gonna put this in a visual metaphor. So um, y'all are anime fans, probably not a lot of crossover football fans, but this is also Texas. Um, if you've ever seen the, uh, the Red River Rivalry football game, Cotton Bowl Stadium, Dallas, you know, UT versus OB, uh, University of Oklahoma. One side's wearing burnt orange, the other side is wearing garbage. <laughs> uh, so the stadium is split exactly down the middle, right? So imagine those two halves trying to kill each other. Now imagine that times two. A lot of people. Big battle. Enormous battle. Anyway, it finally resolves with the, the uh, victory of the Tokugawa Associated Eastern Army um, over the Toyotomi Affiliated Western Army. Um, incidentally, if you want to see the anime version of the Battle of Sekigahara, the anime Drifters starts out the first minute of episode one of the Battle of Sekigahara, so that's cool. So, Tokugawa Ies here, um, he becomes Shogun in 1603, and he basically immediately resigns. He is Shogun for only like two or three years. You're like, why did you go through all this effort to only, re only last like two or three years? Well, because he has read all the books and he's seen all the movies and he knows how this story goes. <laughs> so. He appoints his son as his successor, right? And he basically is the power behind the throne. Like, he allows his son to consolidate power, and everybody knows if you cross his son, you have to deal with daddy. Nobody <laughs> crosses his son. And uh, he eventually gives his son one final present, which is the siege of Osaka Castle, which is where um, uh, Toyotomi Hideyori, son of Hideyoshi, is living castle falls, Hideyori and his mother commit suicide, and because, again, Tokugawa is a cold cucumber, he has Hideyori's infant son killed. Snips those plot threads, there will be no sequel. And thus establishes the Tokugawa dynasty, which will rule Japan for the next 260 years. Oh, one mention. So I forgot to mention the Battle of Sekigahara here. Now, the, the losers of the Battle of Sekigahara actually ended up getting the last laugh. Uh, a number of the defeated clans helped take down the Tokugawa shogunate 250 years later during the Meiji Restoration. To revenge is a, is a dish set 
Revenge the dish, dish served very, very, very cold. <laughs> so anyway, we get to our anime recommendation of the Sengoku period, which is Sengoku Basara, or sometimes known as Samurai Kings. It is a ridiculous anime based on a fighting video game, um, featuring all of the prominent uh, Sengoku warlords. So we have up there at top, starting going clockwise, we have Oda Nobunaga, who drinks blood or drinks wine out of a human skull. Sure. We have Akechi Mitsuhide, who li literally runs around the Grim Reaper site. Sure. Um, and then we've got uh, Oda Nobunaga's brother-in-law, whose name I can't remember off the top of my head. And then we get Date Masamune, mm -hmm. who rides around on a horse with handlebars and exhaust pipes. He doesn't use them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Takeda Shingen, who is huge and very loud, and at one point rides a horse vertically up a castle wall. Like one does. <laughs> and then Sanada Yukimura, who fights with not one, but two spears. Yeah. It, it is glorious fun. Yes. Asai Nagamasa is the brother in law. There you go. <laughs> He's not important. He's not important. Yeah. Alright, so now we roll Minor into. Minor antagonist. <laughs> yeah. Now we roll into the, the uh, Edo, Edo period, sometimes called the Tokugawa period. Uh. <laughs> We're in chapter five, chapter five of seven. We've got half an hour left. All right, so the capital moves to Edo, which is now modern day Tokyo. Um, it remained a feudal society with the shogun in control, and there are still daimyo, but they serve him. It is um, best known for a policy of foreign isolationism. People weren't allowed to leave the country. They also weren't allowed to enter the country. There was no, basically no international trade. The only trade that was allowed was, was with the Dutch on one small island, and that was it. Um, there was a very strict social hierarchy, the rulers were on top because they ruled. Below them were the samurai, who were also important because they fought. Below that were peasants, because peasants made the most important thing, which was food. Next, below that were the craftsmen, which made important things, but they weren't as important as food, so they're less important than peasants. And below that, we have the merchants, who didn't make anything at all and were considered parasites. They were also extremely rich, very rich parasites. Um, it was a period known for urbanization. I think it, well, I can't remember seeing a stat, like, in seven, something, sometime in the 1700s, the population of Tokyo was, I think, 1.3 million people. Like, incredible amount of urbanization. Um, economic growth, this is also a period known for the flourishing of arts and entertainment, the very, very Japanese sort of cultural stuff that we think of today when we think of Japan. Um, so, we get to a little bit of Edo era fashion. Um, women's hair is up, lots of little combs, sleeves got a lot wider. Um, these, uh, the sashes, the obi belts, got a lot thicker, and they had like really cool knots in the back. You look at them, you think they're very impractical, but are they any worse than hoop skirts? Or no. corsets? Or corsets? Not really. No. Um, there were restrictions on you know what colors you could wear. Like merchants were restricted, like um, could only wear like blues and grays and browns and so forth. And but they got around that by having like really bright kimono linings. So you know, um, only samurai have to carry swords. If you ever see in one of these period pieces a guy with a sword, that's a samurai. No matter what. Anyway, so now we get to the Edo, 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 I was pronouncing the name wrong. Edo period samurai. As I said, they are a social class rather than a profession. So you would have samurai bureaucrats, and you had, you know, occasional samurai craftsmen. And the samurai families were a very special thing. Um, it's, it's also hereditary. They were roughly 5 to 6% of the population, which is actually a much larger percentage of the population than you would have nobility in Europe. Um, they were heavily urbanized. Um, they were the only class permitted to carry swords. They generally, it was mostly symbolic, they didn't really use them all that often, but they you know, one of the benefits of being a samurai is that there was a law in the books that said if a peasant dissed you, you could kill him. Um, probably didn't use that all that often, but, you know, in theory they could. So then we get to our first recommendation, oh no, sorry, arts and culture. So this was also a time of flourishing of arts and culture. Um, there was a revival of Confucian philosophy, um, there was uh, Ikkyo prints, kabuki plays, Bunraku puppets, textile advancements, haiku, haiku poetry, calligraphy, all this cool stuff. Um, there was also, um, they did import books of science from the Dutch, so they weren't like, when, when, the, um, when Japan was later opened up to the West, it wasn't just like, oh my god, you guys can do magic, it was just like, oh, you guys have figured out how to apply all this stuff and actually make technology. So they did not know about science, they just didn't use it. Um, it was known as the Dutch Studies, or Study of Western Sciences. Um, so now we get to our first recommendation, which is House of Five Leaves, uh, which is a story about a kind of introverted, slightly, I'd say, derpy samurai. 
Um, he's kind of a, he just seems like a disappointment. He's very skilled, but he's just not a very inspiring personality. His lord fires him for kind of being derpy, and he comes to Tokyo looking for work. And he's not very successful, and he's very hungry, but eventually he makes some friends, some really good friends, and they all hang out in this one inn together. But the problem is his friends have this thing where when they need money, they go and kidnap somebody and hold them for ransom. And he's not quite sure how he feels about this because they're his friends, but, you know, they're criminals. So, you know, it's kind of like a slow, kind of, kind of slice of lifey sort of thing. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, due to licensing issues, well, this series is not able to be found in um, legal manners. So, as much as I advocate for watching things on legal sites, Crunchyroll, Funimation, Hulu, High Dive, all of that, uh, if you really want to watch this show, you Which might I recommend. have to find some other means of doing so. so uh, yeah, you, you know where to look. Yeah, y'all are all, y'all are all really, really out of, I mean, I'm talking about really out of print expensive DVDs. Yeah, yeah, that's what we're talking about. Anyway, y'all are all old enough to remember the Dark Ages. <laughs> Which gets us to our second, second recommendation, because this was a realistic one. I get to recommend a really unrealistic manga. And that is my favorite manga of all time, this is my panel, so I get to plug it, is Oku, with my Fumi Yoshinaga. So I made fun of the gender-bent warlords of the Sengoku period, but gender-bent shoguns are where it's at. Um, it takes place in an uh, alternate Japan in which a very convenient disease has wiped out um, about 75% of the male population. Yes. Um, and thus women have to take political power. <laughs> um, this manga has everything. Um, it's got history stuff, it kind of walks through the Tokugawa period, kind of shogun by shogun. It, uh, I think it starts out in the 1600s, and the last volume I read it was in the 1800s. Um, it has some it kind of interesting from a sociological perspective, because it talks about how this would actually work. Like, how a society with that level of, of uh, a sex imbalance would actually function. Um, and not only how it functioned, how it got to that part in the first place, how you know, the, uh, the old order was overturned, so it actually thinks about its, its premise. Um, it is also full of these incredibly gorgeous and often tragic romances that are just magnificent. Um, it's got more court politics than you can shake a stick at. It has a gripping medical drama as they try to cure the disease, foreign relations, tax policy, it has everything. It has explicit content. So much sex in this manga. <laughs> Very tasteful sex, but so much. That, that little explicit content warning is not just for show. <laughs> anyway, oh, one more thing about it. One more way to sell it. Um, so it also has the best translation I have ever seen in any manga ever. Um, Viz is the translator. They translated it into kind of a pseudo Shakespearean English. So if you ever wanted to see a manga characters you know, declare, you know, wherefore thou speakest us to me, vile, on thee. vile cur, and forsooth, this is your manga. <laughs> it is absolutely excellent. And it's not just me who thinks it's great, um, it was actually nominated for an Eisner Award. So, so now we are going to talk about a country we have not yet mentioned very important for the next part of this presentation. And that country is... America! Fuck yeah! yeah. yeah. Thank you. It's 18 plus, we can do that. Yeah! All right, so, uh, hot off achieving manifest destiny, expanding our territory from sea to shining sea, the U.S. looks towards the Pacific. And it wants sides, it wants to become a Pacific, a Pacific power. The problem is, all the other European countries have already, you know, staked their claims. You know, there's colonies and influence and stuff. What can the United States do? We want to be in on this colonization thing, too. But there's this country that no one has been able to enter yet. No one has made them trade with them yet. It is the perfect new market for the United States. And uh, they also want to, um, you know, refill, uh, refuel the railing ships, so they need a port. So it's time for the United States to go and kick down the door of Japan. So, in 1852, <laughs> yes, I know, anime is amazing. Uh, so, in 1850, a little more on that in just a second, it's, it's, it's an even better story than you think. 
So in 1852, the United States sends out Commodore Matthew Perry to go and make the Japanese trade with us. It'll be um, he does, <laughs> Pardon? Matthew Perry, friends. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Definitely the same guy. Uh, actually, not the same guy. Um, I said, interesting story, we'll see in a second. Um, so he sails not out of California, but out of Virginia. So he takes a ship all the way across the Atlantic, all the way around Africa, across the Indian Ocean, and he finally gets to Japan. And he, you know, kind of takes this carrot and a stick approach. So he's got these really huge warships, and he sails straight into Tokyo Bay. He, on his way there, he makes sure to fire his cannons for, tar for target practice, all the time. He wants everybody to know he is here and he is scary. But he also, like I said, carrot stick approach. He brings with him all this cool stuff you could have in Japan. Look at all this cool stuff. We've got a working telegraph, telescopes, books, an actual miniature railway. You know, look at all this stuff you could have if you trade with less Japan or the stuff you could be hurt or, you know, how much you could be hurt if you didn't trade with us, Japan. But he, think on it. he was also very kind and he gave them some, he gave some of the Japanese nobles a set of gifts uh, chosen to represent uh, the best that America has to offer. So you have a clock, a sword, two guns, five gallons of whiskey. Yeah, guns and whiskey, you would say. <laughs> oh. So, um, Perry's approach worked, and the Tokugawa shogunate signed a treaty with the United States, a very unequal treaty, it should be noted, that opened Japan to foreign trade. And other countries soon jumped in, and soon, suddenly Japan was trading with everybody, also very unequally. And uh, so, we do have to talk about a little about this, dude. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, so, in case you all were wondering, this is not actually, this extremely American dude, he's very American, he's not actually anime Commodore Matthew Perry, this is anime Captain Matthew Perry, uh, his son, uh, apparently, and nothing to do with Japan whatsoever, yeah, nothing to do with him at all, but apparently the Commodore himself was too old to make him, you know, a pretty boy, yeah, uh, apparently the truth line he somewhere, he just couldn't rock the thigh eyes like his son no. could, so, <laughs> So yeah, there you go, you're going to be a Captain Matthew Perry, you fight in the Mexican War, and then hundreds of years later, anime turns you into this. <laughs> yeah! yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm down. So, now we get to our next chapter, chapter 6, the Bakumatsu. Very intriguing. Yes. So. So it liter Bakumatsu literally translates to end of the shogun, or you get the, remember the Bakufu, the, the tent government? So this is literally the end of the tent government. Um, it was a period in which there was um, a conflict and revolutionary activity between pro-imperial forces and pro-shogun forces. Essentially what happened was the sh concessions made but made two Western powers made the shogun look really, really weak. Remember, shogun is the barbarian subduing generalissimo. Barbarians have just kicked down the door and they're in your house and taking your stuff. You're not a very good barbarian subduing generalissimo. So there was also other social problems that were going on at the time. Um, urbanization putting pressure on peasants and agriculture. Merchants are becoming are very wealthy, but they have no political influence. They're not happy about that. Um, the nobles owe debts to the merchants, which kind of turns the social order on its head. Due to the new trade with foreign countries, tr the economy has to shift very quickly. Like for instance, um, the Western countries have gone through the Industrial Revolution and can produce cloth very, very cheaply which immediately puts, all, and now it's much cheaper to import cloth than to produce your own. And for example, the entire Japanese textile industry crashes, and this happens in multiple industries in Japan. So terrible economic problems. Um, in order to appease the daimyo, the shoguns made concessions, allowing them to build up their militaries, which you can probably guess did not turn out well. Um, eventually, um, let's see, do, 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 do. eventually due to all this conflict, the last of the Tokugawa shoguns um, abdicates in 1868. The emperor officially becomes power, uh, the uh, in charge, not, not really, um, and the capital is renamed to Tokyo, literally eastern capital, so the capital actually moved to Tokyo, and you know, and then we get from there. So talking about the actual conflict, the pro-imperial versus the pro-bakufu forces, um, slogan of the pro-imperial forces, revere the emperor, expel the barbarian. Um, yes, the barbarian meaning us. Yay! Um, so the shogun was most prominently uh, opposed by the Chosu and Satsuma domains, those ones who were defeated in Sekihara, they're finally back. 
Um, let's see, where was I? I lost my spot. Um, and eventually the pro-imperial forces seize uh, Ido, Kyoto, and Osaka. Ido falls with next to no fighting. Um, and the last of the Tokugawa loyalists were finally defeated in the Boshin War in 1869. Now, since we're talking about the Bakumats, though there is a group we have to talk about because they feature in literally every anime ever made about this period, even though generally they were not actually that important. I'm talking about the Shinsengumi. Um, I, bought, I had a couple of books here that I used for reference to emphasize they were not important. Neither of them even had a sliver or whisper about them whatsoever. They were not actually that important. However, they've been very, very heavily romanticized. A lot of them were young, a lot of them died young and presumably handsome. There's kind of this idea of this lost cause, lost to the samurai thing, which has built them up to be a lot bigger than they were. They were an officially sanctioned band of pro bakufu swordsmen who functioned out of Kyoto. Um, they, let's see, going. Yeah, they were formed to guard Kyoto from pro imperial Roman. Um, their name is actually really boring. Um, it literally translates to like newly selected corps. It's just the new guys. That's all they were, the new guys. Um, there were only ever about 400 of them total. Um, their crowning achievement was the Ikadai incident in which the Shinsengumi broke up a pro-imperial cell that was planning on setting the fire to Kyoto and kidnapping the emperor. So, anyway, another fun fact about the Shinsengumi. Yes, uh, they're always depicted wearing these sky blue haoris, um, while with the white markings on the sleeves and the hems. They actually only ever wore this uniform for maybe one year of this whole fight. Yeah. So, yeah, it's the, you know, yeah. So, anyway, so, we get some more fun stuff. All right, so. Cool. so one fun thing about the Bakumatsu Amatu, is that it is modern enough that we actually have photographs of many of these historical figures. So are you ready to have your vision and dream shattered? Yeah. So, <laughs> so here we have three of the Shinsengumi members as depicted in the Otome game, Hakuhoki, uh, which also has many anime adaptations. First, we have Vice Commander Hijikata Toshizo, Commander Kondo Isumi, and Third Unit Commander Saito Hajime. Will you do the honors, Marianne, of showing us what they actually look like? All right. And... Hey there! Here they are! Yay! Yay. Yay. It's fun to see that. Yeah. I was like, Kondo Takeshi. Although, a little bit of credit to Haji, uh, Saito Hajime, though. That's him kind of old, so he presumably had more hair when he was young. Um, yep. Yeah. You mean they weren't vampires? No, they were not vampires. I'm Probably not. not. I mean... Yeah. Um, <laughs> though we would like to credit the Token Ranbu anime for yes. actually trying. They tried for real. They trying. They uh, tried. Look at that. They tried. Yeah, look. They even beached a photo. Yeah. Like, he's a, it's a pretty photo now. It's a, but it's like a legit, you know. Yeah. So they, they tried. He hosted our chef. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, we get to our anime recommendations of the period, and so both of them are Simpson Gumi based. I picked two from slightly different genres here. So first up, we get Peacemaker Kurogana, which is about a mid, it's a mid 2000s shonen anime with a very yelly mid 2000s anime shonen protagonist who joins the Shinsen Gumi in order to avenge the death of his father. And the reason I recommend this one is that it is surprisingly grounded for being a um, a shonen anime, like. Um, it never, it makes sure it is very focused on the fact that it is about a group of people whose job it is to kill other humans. It is very dark, it is surprisingly bloody, um, there's like just not a lot of like, you know, it, it, it's like literally about killing other people, and they emphasize this. At one point, the very yelly, angry shoujo protagonist gets a man killed! because he name drops a name when he should not drop a name, and the Shinsengumi member he is with has to switch to kill the witnesses mode. This anime gets dark. Um, it also has some very spectacular sword fights. They actually like, animated the sword fights to look like sword fights instead of like speed lines or let me fire a beam of energy from my sword. They're like actual sword moves. Uh, the kind of other end of the spectrum is Hakuoki here, which is about a girl who dresses as a boy to join the Shinsengumi in order to find her missing father. And this is a more on the sky of nonsense because all the Shinsengumi members become vampires at some point. They're demons. Why not? Yeah. Um, there is an anime adaptation. I have not seen enough of it to have an opinion on it, but I would highly recommend the game it's based on. The Otome game it's based on has gorgeous art. It's 
really well written, it's extremely well translated. Um, it is chock full of historical detail despite the vampire's nonsense. Like there's actually like a glossary or like a little mini encyclopedia within the games. You can look up like the various factions and stuff. It is like hardcore, like it's for like girls who like history a lot. Um, sometimes their husbands. <laughs> and sometimes their husbands, yes. And um, my wife is not here. <laughs> and uh, the uh, the game you can pick it up on Steam. Um, it's, it's broken into two parts, and you can get it like during a Steam sale for like ten bucks. So you know it's cheap, it's good, it's great. I highly recommend it. Anyway, moving on. So now we get to the Meiji era, and which starts being a little bit less fun here for me to talk about because it becomes a little bit more depressing and based on real life. So during this period, um, Edo is renamed Tokyo, becomes home of the imperial court. There is a large-scale adoption of Western customs and governmental styles. As one, um, it becomes a republic, like not like a republic, but more of a representative democracy or representative government. As one book I put, one book I was reading put it, it became, it um, essentially transitioned. Remember, Shogun retired in 1868. They adopted their constitution in 1889, essentially transitioning, just transitioning from a feudal, feudal society to a, the, as the book I was putting it, the only uh, representative government east for east of the Suez Canal in the space of 21 years, like in time, just less than a single generation. Um, the samurai were not allowed to carry swords anymore. The daimyo were essentially paid off. They became members of the nobility, but they weren't like landed. This is not like you don't have a territory anymore that you govern. Um, also during this period, the Japanese start building up their military and modernize their military, and they began pursuing expansionist policies. They um, uh, seized Hokkaido in the north. Um, they fought wars against China and Russia, um, eventually annexing Taiwan and Korea. Korea. Korea will remain a colony of Japan for the next 30 years, and there is very bad blood between Korea and Japan even to this day over that time period. Um, they were. Japanese were not beneficent rulers by far. Anyway, so we get to our final chapter. They were, we've got eight minutes left. Would y'all mind staying over if we go over a little bit? All right, cool. So now we get if they let like. if they let us. All right, we'll have to hurry. All right, so 20th century and beyond. And beyond. So first up, we have the I'll try and hurry. We have the Taisho era. So Japan joins the Allied powers against Germany during World War One. They seized German-controlled ports in China and German-held islands in the Pacific. They joined the League of Nations at the end of the war for, to uh, promote world peace. And uh, one of their contributions was to League of Nations. They were like, hey, League of Nations, can we put uh, like a clause in our charter that says we're not going to be racist because y'all are all white and we're not? And the rest of the League of Nations was like, nah. And Japan is like, ah, all right, be racist. Um, they, uh, there was some movement toward democratization. Um, let's see, uh, man over 25 got the vote. Also during the p this period was the Great Kanto Earthquake, which destroyed most of Tokyo and Yokohama, around three million homes, leading to the deaths of about 100,000 people. Anyway, so now we get to Shara era part one. Um, so rise of nationalism, authoritarianism, and military rule in the 1930s. Japan pursues expansionist policies, and as I said before, is not a beneficent overlord. Um, there is still a tremendous amount of bad blood between Japan and the rest of Asia over a lot of this. Um, Japan, uh, for example, um, to kind of do a study in contrast here, so Germany, after the war, kind of owned up to what it did. It acknowledged that what it did was very bad, it was their fault, and they will never do it again, and they teach it in their schools that they will never do this again. Japan has been a bit more unwilling to admit their war crimes. Um, for instance, um, one of the big sticking points between Japan and Korea is the use of what is known as comfort women, which is a euphemism for women who were pressed into sexual slavery to Japanese troops during the war. Um, overall, overall, throughout Asia, there were about 200,000 women who were essentially forcibly raped during this period. Um, and. Uh, I think Japan came to an arrangement to pay off some of the survivors of, of this program with Korea. Want to guess what year? 2015. And it's still not all the way resolved. Um, there is a particular shrine in Japan that's dedicated to their war dead. 
And every time someone important visits that shrine, like usually the prime minister, the rest of Asia, China and Korea, will literally lodge like a formal diplomatic complaint because they consider it to be honoring Japanese war criminals. It's kind of a really ugly time. Um, also, I would have to have to admit, talk discuss the uh, what is known as the Rape of Nanjing. Um, if you ever want to know the extent of human brutality, um, look it up. This is a happy panel, so I'm not going to talk about it now, but oh god. Um, anyway, war concludes with the, um, the USA dropping nuclear bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, leading to the deaths of hundreds of, or, you know, well over 100,000 people. Um, I think 135 total, 135,000 total in Hiroshima and around 50,000 in Nagasaki. And the US, uh, technically the Allies, but pretty much most of the US, occupied Japan after the war. So now we get to mark back to happy times. Shower era part two. Um, Japan is forced to demilitarize. They have only now a self-defense force rather than a proper standing military. Um, even though it is basically a military, just really small. Um, Japan pursues economic, economic um, well, not pursues, but they go through an economic miracle. They make they make everything. They make cars. They make consumer goods. Their economy just booms. It's amazing. This is also the period in which they make start making anime. Yay! Yay! That's what we're here for. Anyway, and then we come to the Heisei era, starting in 1889. That economic bubble bursts. You get what's known as the Lost Generation, in which you know people aren't quite as well off as they would otherwise. There's employment problems. There's also demographic shifts, in which Japan is very much an aging, aging society. Death rate greatly exceeds the birth rate. They also don't allow immigration, so that's causing problems in terms of labor and, you know, how are they going to care for all these really elderly people, which are becoming a larger and larger percentage of their country. Um, and as I said, the era is scheduled to end at the end of April 2019, when the emperor retires. So, next up, we have our anime, re uh, anime recommendation. Um, and I, I could have picked pretty much anything that took place you know, now, because that would work, but I chose to highlight two pieces that are actually period pieces. Um, the first one up is In This Corner of the World, which is about a girl in pre-war Japan, who, or just shortly, shortly before World War II, who enters into arranged marriage. It's a relatively happy arranged marriage. And it's like kind of slice and lifey about her trying to get along with her new family and new in-laws. And then World War II happens, and now there are bombings and food rationing and shortages of, shortage of supplies, and it becomes like much more like a, a story about life on the Japanese home front during World War II. It's, it's a movie you can find it on Netflix. I would warn you if you watch it, it will pull at your heartstrings. It is really soft, it's really pretty, and very full of feels. And uh, the other one I'd recommend is Kids on the Slope, which is a, a story set in the 1960s about a boy who joins his friend's jazz band. And it just kind of it just feels very time period. It feels like it's a coming of age story, and it just seems very, but based on people's experiences. It's just, it's wonderful, and the best part is they um, rotoscoped all the music performance sequences, so it looks like the characters are actually playing the music. It's gorgeous. Anyway, so now we enter into the future. What's coming up next? So Japan is scheduled to host the Olympics in 2020, but that's all moot because, as we know, Tokyo will be overrun by fire games and city destroying escorts in 2019. Yes, y'all, want to feel old? The futuristic, futuristic settings accurate as Senin is 2019. And that, folks, is the end of our panel. <laughs> that um, the girl is from Hiroshima, and her family is in Hiroshima, so you can guess how this ends. Yes. Spoilers! <laughs> like, yeah. 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 The other contrast, though, you can do is find out that the firebombing of Tokyo oh, yes, the fire yeah, bombing. actually yeah. killed more people than the uh, Indeed, yeah. Okay. Uh, Great River Fireflies actually starts with the firebombing of Kobe. Yep. Yeah. And, yeah. Whoa! Uh, <laughs> 
Hiroshima, by the way, awesome place. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, there's also one.